Jeffrey, thank you so much for the chance to chat with you. I really do appreciate it. Um, Commitment to Life is a powerful film. Um, just a just a wonderful. Well, wonderful is a hard word to use because it's heart render heart wrenching from start to finish. Um, but but what drew you to this story? What it, why is this such an important one for you to tell? Well, I've made um, a series of films before that are m- more biographical in nature. You know, I made movies about Tab Hunter and Divine and Vito Russo, who was a gay activist. Um, but the the specter of AIDS is always sort of shows up in these movies because the people that I make movies about came of age in the during the time when AIDS was um, was in uh, our culture in a in a very big way, you know. But this was this was a film that came to me. Um, uh, APLA Health, formerly known as AIDS Project Los Angeles, they started thinking that well, it's going to be our 40th anniversary. Uh, why don't we start thinking about making a movie about? Um, our organization, and in particular, Los Angeles, and how Los Angeles responded to the HIV AIDS crisis, uh, because LA is not really thought of as a place where a lot of really important things happened in terms of um, the epidemic. You know, we think about New York, and there's been movies made about New York and San Francisco, but not about LA, and in particular, how the entertainment community and how Hollywood got involved to uh, help to destigmatize this and raise money and really change the course of the epidemic, which we did here. Uh, so with APLA uh, Health, uh, we, we about three years ago, we decided let's let's embark on this. And little did we know we would be filming the movie during another epidemic or pandemic. And uh, we were filming our interviews at the height of uh, of COVID um, in, I guess, November of 2020. We, we started filming our interviews. So it was very strange and ironic uh, to be making the movie around that time. And a lot of the people we interviewed who lived through the the epidemic, you know, they had there were a lot of sort of eerie um uh similarities and we we had we talked about that um uh, uh between a big pane of glass and masks and you know all that stuff so it's an interesting time to make this movie that's for sure you know i i'm glad you said that because that that was one of the things that was so striking to me now again they're entirely different scenarios entirely different situations um but did that resonate with the community, the, the the community, the AIDS community, or people you were interviewing? Because, you know, you're talking about things like isolating individuals. You're talking about, you know, government involvement. Uh, and and from someone from someone on the outside, that certainly echoes to me. But I, I was wondering what what those experiences were like for you. It's true. I mean, at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, there was complete radio silence from the federal government. You know, the federal government just, they would not acknowledge it. They wanted it to just go away because it was really targeting, um, um, to be honest, like despised members of society. You know, gay people were, it's not like it is today where there are a lot of out gay people and people know who we are as a community. It was very, at the time, still still relatively closeted. Um, so gay men were getting sick, intravenous drug users were getting sick, sex workers were getting sick, you know, people of color, you know, communities that were more marginalized. And mm-hmm. so the federal government, which was beholden to, you know, the people that got Ronald Reagan elected were mostly, so the, the evangelical community got Ronald Reagan elected. So he felt like beholden to that community. So he couldn't look like he was really too, doing too much to help these communities that were not in favor, right, let's say. So... So there was um, radio silence at the beginning. It took Ronald Reagan several years to even say the word publicly. He didn't say the word AIDS publicly until 1987. So at the beginning of COVID, we had a little bit of a similar situation where people were playing politics with this. And we had a president at that time um, who wanted this just to go away because it would look bad for him, right? Um, And at the beginning of COVID, we didn't know how it was spread at the very beginning. Um, We didn't, you know, remember when we were all washing our packages and uh, hosing down our groceries, you know, uh, we didn't know that it was uh, pretty much air- airborne at the beginning of um, the AIDS epidemic. We didn't know how it was spread either. So there was a lot of conversation. Can you get this through the air? If I go visit my sick friend in the hospital, can I get it? So we saw a lot of really um, awful dehumanizing uh, situations with people who uh, had AIDS uh, were in hospitals and isolated in the hospitals or left in the room alone or even uh, nurses and doctors wouldn't want to go near them. They would leave the food out on the tray, on the floor, outside the room. Uh, people would be dressed in full hazmat suits. So the people who went um, to care for people with AIDS, um, to be with them and to help them, to hold them in their arms, even before we knew that it was a virus, before we knew that it was transmitted, that it was not easy to get HIV, as we later found out, they didn't know that at the time. So that was really moving to me. 
you know, but people died alone. A lot of people died alone at the beginning of the AIDS crisis and the beginning of the, of COVID was a very similar thing. You know, people were um, saying goodbye to their loved ones, you know, through, through, uh, you know, plastic sheeting and plate glass. It's just really awful and really sad. So, so yeah, to answer your question, there was a lot of sort of uncanny um, uh, uh, similarities, but also like, you know, we, we talk about COVID and uh, it did bring out a lot of really, really um, despicable behavior on the part of, let's say, the general public and also politicians who were using it as a wedge, you know, but it also brought out the best, you know, COVID also brought out the best in us as a people. That's the majority of the response to it was very loving and positive. And we all really did try to band together to try to figure out what this was, to take, make sure that we were taking care of our friends and loved ones, make sure that, you know, let's protect each other. That happened in the AIDS crisis too. We had to figure out how are we going to protect each other? And that's when safe sex came. That's where safe sex came from. The whole idea of safe sex that didn't exist for gay people, you know, like safe sex with a condom. What do I need a condom for? I'm not getting anybody pregnant, but um, it became necessary to educate the gay community. And so we, we did step up and figure out a way to take care of each other and protect each other. Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking about that too. The the, the politicization of some ways of use of, use of uh, safe sex and condoms versus masks as well as sort of the the public finally you know this whole conversation going about it and the the pushback and and it, oh man it, it was fascinating to watch um and COVID had COVID had a uh, you know it, it aids the first famous truly famous person to acknowledge that he had aids was rock hudson very very famous movie star that everybody in the country knew and loved for decades and we had even we had a rock hudson in COVID too with tom hanks you know when tom hanks got COVID on the set of elvis that was like I remember that being like, oh, we have a rock, we're having a Rock Hudson moment now because everybody knows Tom Hanks and everyone loves Tom Hanks, right? So uh, now you know in in America we really it takes a celebrity to make us pay attention to things sometimes. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's just the way it is. Well, it's funny, I you know you say that about Tom Hanks, and I mean certainly ironically, Tom Hanks has a connection in in this way as well later on in the film. But um, it is true when I remember somebody saying, well, if Tom Hanks can get it, any of us can get it. And it's like, well, we could have before, but right. there's something about that statement. That's right. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Hollywood in this one, because this is, there is a lot of Hollywood in this film. And I find it so interesting, uh, you know, that, that Hollywood became a mouthpiece for the gay community in the midst of the AIDS epidemic on so many different levels. Um, and yet that you have these these conservative mouthpieces arguing against it. But Hollywood seemed to, you know, you even got Universal and Paramount hosting hosting AIDS Walk and, and all of these things. And I'm just wondering, what is it about uh, Hollywood in the arts community? Why is that such an open door and a safe space for these sorts of conversations and support that that are more difficult to find in other spaces? Well, Hollywood, there's a lot of gay people in the entertainment business. I mean, that's just the reality of it. You know, gay people are, are drawn to the community. You could be behind the scenes. I'm not talking about um, people in front of the camera. That's a little bit of a different story, but you know, gay people could have a, a relatively open lives behind the camera in Hollywood, although it was still very closeted. I mean, there were no openly, very few of any openly gay executives with any with any power, you know, no openly gay, very few if any openly gay celebrities, but you could work in the entertainment industry. You know, you could be a, a hairstylist, let's say, to, 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 which is a little bit of a, a cliche, but it's true. You know, there are a lot of makeup artists and Joan Rivers, um, had a, a, her very close friend and makeup artist uh, had HIV and, and later AIDS and, and died of this. And so she saw it firsthand. So there were people in the industry who said, well, we have to, we need to take care of our family because th this, this is, they saw uh, this as a family and we have people in our community who are suffering, right? So people like um, David Geffen, who was probably one of the most powerful people in the industry during the years of the AIDS crisis, he was in the closet still. I mean, it was sort of an open secret. So sort of the glass closet that we used to say, right? Um, but he wasn't out, but he was doing everything he could to do what he to, to what he could to help uh, behind the scenes. And then when APLA AIDS Project Los Angeles came along, he joined the board and he helped to um, um, bring a lot of uh, talent to these big fundraisers that APLA did. You know, he brought in Barbara Streisand and he brought in all these big stars. And then he himself, uh, and we show it in the film, he chose a moment. Um, uh, to talk about all the friends that he lost uh, uh, during this crisis. And and he came out publicly, which now is not that huge a deal. I mean, people 
you know, coming out all the time and it, people are used to it now, but at the time to have a person at that level um, to come out who really, you know, at that point, so many people had died and um, he, he felt that he needed to declare himself, which he did. And that was a really big deal and made it safe for other people to do the same thing. Yeah. I, I, I love that part of the story because I, you know, it, it hadn't even, I didn't even realize, I think at one point it's mentioned that it's, it's only 10 years before that is decriminalized, that the right. gay is decriminalized. So I'm, my goodness, the power of saying. That's right. Well, you know, you know D, it was um, uh, about 10 years before we were still considered uh, mentally ill, right? So yeah. only about 10 years before the, the American Psychological Association, you know, changed the definition and took us off the list of mental illnesses. But it says only 10 years before. So there's still so much stigma about homosexuality to begin with. And then you have this deadly disease coming along. You know, the stigma was just unimaginable. And you have to also remember, you know, there were still sodomy laws in effect. This isn't really in the film, but, you know, the Supreme Court upheld the, the sodomy law in Bowers versus Hardwick in the, at the height of the AIDS epidemic. So this is like, I think people don't just re really remember just how fraught this period of time was, how much fear and real fear. I mean, and people with AIDS, could lose everything. You know, they they would lose their job. They could lose their apartment. They could lose their friends. Their family could disown them. They could be left with nothing. That's why it was so important for APLA, for AIDS Project Los Angeles to exist at that time because there was so little uh, in terms of resources. So we had to create our own institutions. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting. You know, one of the things that, that I think the film really addresses towards the end, it starts talking about how the narrative changes, begins to change. But one of the key things that, that you, you've you got this, this culture of shame thrown upon the gay community, those with HIV, um, and people say, you know, actors in Hollywood saying that they had better not say they do or they'll never work again. Um, these sorts of conversations taking place. What is it, in your opinion, that had to happen for that narrative to begin to shift? What what had to change for for that power of shame to to begin to crack? Well, we're still living with that shame. I, mean, I don't think it's really entirely gone away. You know, how many openly HIV positive celebrities can you mention? Can you name? I mean, I can name sure. just a handful. You know, but um, I think uh, uh, although Hollywood did do a lot to um, try to address this with with uh, uh, tried to destigmatize, trying to raise money, doing all these things. There were still a lot of people working in Hollywood who faced discrimination and mm -hmm. uh, could not be open about their status because they could lose their job. Um, the protections were really not in place, and there was still they would or people would find some other reason to not hire that person, right? So HIV was just another thing, to, a reason to say no or or to to shun them. And so there was an actor named Brad Davis, who we depict in the film, he starred in Midnight Express, and he was suffering from AIDS. And um, he was doing it behind closed doors, he was working, but he was suffering from this. And nobody could know because if, if, if it came out that he had AIDS, he wouldn't get a job, he wouldn't be working, and he needed to keep his insurance, essentially, you know. Um, so it was only after he decided that uh, a lot of times when a celebrity would die of AIDS, the obituaries would say that they died of something else. You know, when Liberace died or when Robert Reed died or a lot of other people and the people around them thought they were protecting their, the, the legacy because there was still so much shame. And like, well, how did he get it? You know, that's that was the big question. Um, so Brad Davis uh, uh, didn't want that to happen when he died. He 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 didn't feel like he could come out about this in his lifetime. But after he died, his, his wife, uh, Susan, who's in our film, uh, went public with this story. And it really did shame Hollywood, because even though they were doing all these big fundraisers like something like this could be allowed to happen for so many years. So there were efforts to be made that to give job protections. Um, a lot of the big studios came together to try to codify some rules um, and to just help people just survive uh, through this. And so over time, it has been destigmatized, but um, I don't think that's completely gone away. And um, I, I don't I don't know I, uh, if um, Dr. Michael Gottlieb, who, who's in our film, you know, he he advises some of his patients not to necessarily be open about their status on the job, even still to this day, uh, because there's still, you know, so much uh, misunderstanding and stigma and shame. So that's why it is so important for celebrities to be open about their status. I mean, th I'm so happy that Billy Porter is uh, out um, about his status. That's really, really important for people to see that somebody with HIV today who's undetectable and on meds can thrive and have a, a, a happy, normal life. 
Well, and therein lies a question too, and I know this is addressed in the film, but I'm just wondering, uh, the future, where do we go from here? Because, and, and I will say, and I was a little unclear about this in the film, so please correct me, but there's sure. one gentleman or one person that says, um, it's gone, they don't have it anymore. But the next argument is, well, but you know, that's unreasonable to get that out to everybody or, or and, I, and I was sort of a, a little unclear sure. on what the next steps are with HIV treatment. Because what 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 I've always been told, frankly, even growing up, is once you have it, it's it's there yeah. forever. It's manageable. That is true. That's true. Right. It's manageable now. It does not go away because this is. And I'm not a doctor, but you know, I've been yeah. talking to a lot of doctors and making sure. this movie. But um, if you have HIV and you're on these these new, really advanced medications, it's like used to be. You'd have to take a dozen pills yeah. several times a day. Yeah. It's one pill a day, and it can keep your HIV to an undetectable level, which means that the your immune system. You know what? What people people got sick? They didn't get sick because of um, of like AIDS didn't kill them. It was all these other um, conditions that could not, that the body couldn't fight off because they had the virus. So the virus destroys the immune system. So if you got a cold one day that a healthy person would be able to fight off, a person with AIDS couldn't fight it off and it was just advanced, you know? Um, but today, if the virus is undetectable, your immune system can thrive. And also amazingly, you can't pass the virus on to another person. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are at today. And if an HIV negative person, who's sexually active, um, can take what's called PrEP, P-R-E-P, -E and remain negative. Mm. You know, that this is something that even if they're exposed to the virus, if they're on PrEP, um, they, they won't become HIV Preventive. positive. Don't ask me how to explain, don't ask me to explain how that works, but it, that is scientifically proven that that is the case. So if young wow. people today, they need to know about PrEP, they need to know about PrEP, um, and it's a tool in the arsenal to prevent contracting HIV along with other safe sex options. So uh, that's where we're at today. And, and is there going to be a cure in the future? You know, um, um, I don't know the answer to that question, but th th we have the next best thing to a cure, yeah. which is the ability to keep the people with HIV at an undetectable level. That's incredible. Honestly. It is amazing. And that's what we try to show in the movie, like how far we've come over 40 years and how amazing that is. How amazing. And it took a lot of people, um, uh, people with AIDS to 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 participate in these drug trials over the years and we lost a lot of people over these drug trials but we're we are at where, where we are at today because of all those people that we lost yeah, absolutely uh, and I remember those moments I, I was glad when the film starts talking about those moments in the early 90s when the conversation begins to change because I remember those I remember magic I remember uh, I remember Philadelphia I remember the shock waves of Philadelphia and uh, and even salt and pepper and this right. was everything changed, or at least at at least in in my world, I in my isolated corner of the world. Uh, but oh my goodness, uh, Jeffrey, the film is wonderful. I, I genuinely appreciate the chance to speak with you about it. Uh, I wish you the best with it, and it. it uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for uh, inviting me.